Hi, you're listening to the TL Podcast. My name is Thomas Le Huai, and I am interviewing someone who seems ordinary, but who is achieving extraordinary things. That is the quest of this interview. Hello, Sally. How are you doing? I'm good, Thomas. How are you? Very good. That's good. Thank you so much for doing this today. We don't know where we go. I I would like to explore in some way, and I've done a bit of research about you, and you're very special. So I I like to do things maybe outside real estate a little bit because I think you have a lot to offer there. And but let's first start with real estate because you must be doing something right to be uh, uh, in in the top. What is it? Thirty three now? You thirty third? What is it in in the REB? So I thought, hold on, this is an interesting person. But then there's so much more as I start digging about you. So I, I like to explore that as we go, if you don't mind. So what? what don't Absolutely, we just, yeah. Thank you. So why don't we just start with you telling me a little bit about you? Yeah, so I am a, um, I've been in real estate for be 21 years in July. So it's pretty much all I've ever done other than a few kind of jobs, you know, while getting through university and high school. Uh, I started in property management and uh, just discovered that wasn't for me and then got into sales uh, after about six months and I've been uh, selling ever since. I've worked for a number of big firms uh, and then in 2019 decided that I wanted to kind of try it my own way and so started the business, uh, Shelter, in uh, 2019, which at the time I thought was fantastic, but uh, it turned out to be three months before COVID. So that was a bit of a challenge, but we got through it and um, it's going really well. And yeah, so that's that's kind of me when it comes to yeah. real estate. It's going a little bit fast here now. So first you actually studied uh, politics and economics, right? So Correct, so, yes. So what, so what is a person like looking at doing something really serious, wanting to do something that is not so serious? Yeah, well, I think um, I kind of, I don't want to say I fell into real estate because I did at some point make a decision that that was going to be my career, but I always wanted to be in politics. It was something that I really um, was quite passionate about and I still really enjoy it. Uh, I'm actually, you know, heading to Canberra at the end of this week and the first thing on my list of things to do is to, you know, to a parliament house. So I'm a little bit obsessed with with politics. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I got... After I w- while I was studying, I had the opportunity to get into real estate because my auntie had a real estate business. And so it was really just meant to be, you know, I, I guess a weekend job and a couple of uh, days a week just to help her out and also just to subsidise my income while I was studying. And I discovered that I really liked it. I really like um, people. I enjoy being around people. And I think obviously that's the biggest part of real estate is, you know, the interaction with people. And so, you know, politics, you do interact with people, but it's in a much probably more negative way than it is in a um, or more. No, I shouldn't say negative. It's more adversarial. Um, whereas, you know, I see real estate as something where it's more, you know, bringing people together and, um, you know, making things happen. So, yeah. All right. So, so 
I know you rank 33. Can you just tell us so that we, we, we get away, you know, we get it out of the way? What is the secret? Why are you 33rd in Australia? What oh, is what you have that they thought, oh, no, this person here is highly ranked? Um, that's a really interesting question. I don't know what are how REB do their <laughs> rankings. I have asked them in the I past love, because I, I love thought, humility. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I I asked them. I said, how do I become number one if I don't know what your criteria <laughs> is? Um, but they wouldn't give me the criteria. That's there's some secret sauce there. Yes. Uh, but I guess you know what makes makes me me. Uh, definitely a lot of hard work. Um, without a doubt, a lot of hard work. Uh, one of the things that I feel that I'm quite good at is building relationships. So I've built a lot of relationships and I've built what I believe is probably a good, trustworthy reputation uh, for doing the right thing by people. And so that is, I think, probably the closest that you're going to get to a secret source because um, I don't think there really is a secret source. <laughs> So, so you started in 2019, just a few months before COVID started. So, so Shelter, why is the name Shelter? So I decided to call it Shelter. Not many people thought I should call it Shelter, but I decided to call it Shelter because what we do is every four houses that we sell, we build a house um, in a third world country. At the moment, we're working in Cambodia. Yep. Um, so... Not only are we selling sh shelter, which is essentially what houses are, so we're selling shelter, we're also building shelter. So that's why we I decided to call it shelter. And I just thought it's such a logical name for what we do. That's, you know, what we provide. Mm -hmm. And being a uh, econo student of economics, you know, the bottom of the list in um, in the hierarchy of needs is shelter, food and water. So, mm -hmm. and we're, you know, some of the lucky people that get to provide that. So I just... I'm trying to provide it for as many people as I can. I'm going to go back to uh, this thing about the housing in Cambodia a bit later on. But I, I thought that the answer was going to be simply that, you know, you knew something about COVID three months before it happened. And so you wanted to shelter as many people as possible. But oh, yeah, no. I'm, I'm out. I'm out of that. All right, so. <laughs> no, I wish I had a heads up on COVID, but no, definitely not. So what would be the one thing that, Zali, you do better than others then? I definitely think it's building relationships. I think that, you know, I'm very, very um, big on building though, building relationships from a genuine place. So a lot of the people that I deal with, uh, you know, that like we talk about prospecting and we talk about, you know, letterbox dropping and cold calling and I do all of that, but it's not to find someone who's going to sell their house. For me, it's about finding someone to start a relationship. And so I start that relationship with people at whatever stage they're at and build on that. And, you know, I approach it all as if I'm giving advice to, you know, my best friend or my parents or my sister. And I think that that is something that people really appreciate. And so then when it does become time for them to sell, they, you know, they, there's, they, they come back to me. And it's not to say that I don't compete. I definitely still compete. But I think when you give people that genuine advice and build those relationships, over time, it just pays back in spades. Is that where the line farming for the future comes from? Yeah, absolutely. I, that's how I see myself. I do. Yeah. I see myself as a few, as a farmer because I'm <laughs> farming I'm farming for friends. That's what I'm farming for. You, I love it. You I, know? Love it. I, um, I moved... <laughs> I moved to Victoria when I was 19 and uh, I had no friends um, at all. I didn't know anybody. I, I came from Western Australia and, and, you know, came with very little and I uh, I was essentially farming for friends. I just wanted to meet people who would be friends with me and now I've, you know, got a tribe of friends that become clients, that become referrers, that, you know, that, that then leads to a good business. Yeah. So in 2019, you, you opened your own show. I mean, was it easy to transition from being a top performer, looking after yourself into being a leader, running a, a team, running a business and worrying about both sales and the running of a show? Uh, I, well, I have to confess that I I have been very blessed in that I decided to open the business in conjunction with my husband. 
um, our lives kind of, cons- you know, c- were going on different parallels from a career point of view. And at, at one point in 2019, it came together. He just decided to take a sabbatical from his corporate job. And um, it was a time where I said, okay, well, now you can come and help me start the business. And so he actually runs all the business side of things so payroll HR all of that he runs and I mean I've got lots of friends who us you know run businesses by themselves but I think that I I think it is near on impossible to run a business and be a really high performing agent because they're both they're both more than full-time jobs Right. They're not. They're not even full time jobs. They're like full time t- and a half jobs. So yeah. you know, there's just no way that I could do it without him. Yes, and and they probably also demand a very different ways of thinking. Uh, sales thinking is very opportunity search and and, and seek and find. Uh, running right. the business is the balancing act of stock income. What's coming right? So exactly. So do you do recruitment yourself? Yeah, so I do I do recruit. Okay. Um, I think that, you know, as much as I would love not to recruit because I'd like to just focus on selling, um, I think that, you know, my face and my name are the, the part of the business that people um, connect. Yes. So they don't really connect my husband, you know, with the business as much. So he doesn't do recruitment. I'm the one that, that does do the recruiting. Um, it's interesting. I um, When I first started the business, I was really big on, you know, getting out there, calling people, trying to recruit new sales agents. And what I have found is everybody that I have tried to recruit, not everybody, but probably 95% of the people that I've tried to recruit have not ended up joining me or have not ended up being the right person for our business. Wow. What has what has actually happened in the building of the business is the people who I connect with, the people who have similar values to me, the people who do business in a similar way to me have been, we've been attracted to each other. So, you know, I've done a deal with an agent and, you know, we've worked really well together and then we start talking about potentially working together. You know, that's kind of how the business and the recruitment has occurred. I've you know, when I've looked at people's numbers and I've gone, oh, my gosh, that person's writing a million dollars, I should call them and try and get them across, I find that doesn't work. Uh, so it probably ties very, like, this has actually just only just come to me, but it makes sense. It ties back into how I look for business as a sales agent as well. It's more about building that relationship yep. and, uh, and you know, knowing somebody is going to be the right fit for me and my team. Okay. Now, let's talk very quickly about uh, your leadership style. I mean, you run a show. So what is your leadership style? Oh, that's a good question. I'm I'm a real estate agent, so um, I don't know if there's particular names for different types of leaders or if there's things, categories you put them into. But what would my leadership style be? I would say that it would be um, I want everybody in my business to live the best life that they can live. So my leadership style is all about helping them to become the best people that they can be. And that is not, most of the time that's in our business, but it's not always in our business. Um, And so we, we haven't had very many people leave. The people that have left have gone on to things that are better for their life. So, you know, whether that's and it's rarely in real estate. So I'm all about trying to help people figure out how to live their best lives. And I find that when I help people do that, and I'm not saying I'm an expert at it, you know, I'm not nobody's an expert at life, but I think sometimes as a leader, you have an overview of what's happening and you can be more objective than the person who's in their life. Like when I get advice from my mentors, you know, they have an overview of my life rather than me. I'm kind of stuck up in my head. So uh, I think when you can help people live the best life that they can live, they become the most productive people in my business. Oh, wow. Okay, so because <clears throat> I, I 
I thought maybe there was a combination of uh, you lead by example, but I also believe that now listening to you that you are more into transforming leadership, but is there any part of transforming leadership that has maybe a bit of that servant leadership as well? Yeah, probably. I think so. Um, I think, you know, in terms of leading by example, I, I, I would have said that to you probably a year ago or two years ago, I would have said to you, I'm a leader that leads by example. But what I've found is that what suits me does not suit other people. So, you know, the life that I have, I've got four stepchildren, they're older. Um, you know, my husband works in the business. You know, we're lucky enough that I can, you know, have a cleaner come and help me clean my house um, and, you know, things like that. So I, if but so this but there's other people in my business that you know I've got a woman in my business who's amazing but she's a single mother of three kids at uh, three young kids she can't work the same as I can work that's just not possible and that's not her leading her best life so I've kind of changed um you know over the journey because if you are a leader by example then not everybody is able to or wants to follow your example and I think you can sometimes bang your head against a brick wall because you're saying well I'm working really hard I'm prospecting I'm making my 150 calls a, a, a week when in reality like the lady I was just talking about her prospecting is bit better done doing school pick up and drop off because that's where she sees all of the people that own houses in her area so she can get a lot more leads mm -hmm. by actually doing school pick off and drop off so I think that um the the lead by example probably has morphed into I think you're right that more kind of I don't want to say servant because I don't know if that's the right word, but it's just, I guess it's more of a mentoring leadership. Yes. You spoke a little bit earlier about you having mentors looking at you and, and I know I've read some articles where you talk about your mentors. What, what are your three mentors? Oh, they change all the time. Your mentors need to change throughout your life. So I've had some amazing mentors. Um, you know, James Tostevin was one of my big mentors um, in my in my career uh, when I was working uh, at a different organisation. So he's been a big influence in my life. Um, I've had other mentors like, you know, personal trainers. Um, I've had life coaches. So there's different parts of, you know, life that I think you can have mentors in. Um, at the moment, I, you know, one person, I'm um, in business, I've just gone into business, we've uh, opened our second office, and I've um, gone into business with Mal James. Uh, he's quite a, a renowned buyer's advocate in Victoria. Um, and he is, he's, he thinks of the, about things in such a different way to how I think. Uh, and a lot of people would probably look at us and go, you know, he's um, he's a little bit older um, and, you know, would probably look at us and think, oh, you know, that's a bit of an odd couple to form a partnership. But, you know, I'm learning so much from him and getting a lot of really good, not just business advice, but life advice. So he's one of my my mentors at the moment. Um, I am probably at the moment on the search for I always try and have a health mentor and when, by, when I say a health mentor, whether that's, you know, a personal trainer or a life coach or a, um, you know, or a, um, a therapist even, uh, I think you need someone who can help you with your mindset. Uh, and I'm probably in, in a search phase for that. I'm, I've gone through a, a bit of change, uh, you know, in the business recently and in my life. And so I'm you know, probably on the search for a new one. Uh, and then, you know, the other mentors I, I probably have at the moment is is my husband. I, I've spent the first four years of the business just focusing on selling and getting as much traction in the market as I, as I can. And I really want to start focusing on building and growing the business even more. And so I'm really looking to him as to, you know, how he's running the business you know, what can I learn from that, you know, and actually kind of delving more into that side of the business is something that I'm really interested in. Oh, wow. So and that his name is Danny, right? Daniel, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Danny. Yeah, okay. I call him Danny. Yeah, yeah or well, your text says Danny, so I'm just repeating what it, what it, it says there. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, a, a question I'd like to, to share with our audience is from your own experience, after 18 years or, or 21 years in, in, in real estate, what do champions have that other people try to emulate? What is it that they have that is intrinsic? Because, I mean, I, I train a lot of salespeople and sometimes I give the same lines 
to two people and one will go and make a mega ton of money with that line and the other person will go it doesn't work for me you know so yeah i mean is is sales for you something that you're born with or or something that people can just master i definitely think it's something people can master but i do think that it's something you first of all need to figure out what is your motivation because that's what's going to keep you going particularly in real estate let's face it you and i both know it's not an easy game it is hard work it is long hours it's lots of rejection um telling you all the good things but so you need to kind of come back to okay well why am i doing this and you need to tap into that and that's probably what i try and find out first from my team members now why do i keep doing it um and it can't be i mean it can't be money in the sense of money so some for some people their motivation is financial and i think originally my motivation was financial and it is still financial but in a different way so i grew up in quite a poor family i didn't have a lot of money um we moved around a lot we didn't always have a safe and secure house and so my motivation when i started in real estate was i don't want to be that person I don't I want to have a safe and secure home. I want to always feel like I have a place. I want to belong. And so that was my initial motivation, but that so that's financial. So you need money to do that. And it's still financial for me, but it's now probably morphed into providing that shelter for others. Uh, so, you know, we built, since we started the business, we built, we've built built 100 houses uh, and housed, you know, almost 500 people, 400, um, 423, I think it is, people, which is a lot of people. And that really motivates me um, and getting the information back and seeing the houses and seeing how that's affecting people's lives really motivates me. Now, for other people... Um, I've got a young person in my team who wasn't very good at school and a lot of people told them that they were never going to make it. Now, I call that FU motivation and that is something that can motivate a lot of people is you reckon I can't do it or I'm going to show you, you know, and that's really good motivation. So that might be the motivation for someone else. But I think that is really the key to become a champion salesperson. It can't just be, oh, you know, I want to buy a nice car or I want to do this. It has to be, okay, well, what is that that's going to, what are you, what point are you trying to prove is where I think you got to start. Okay, okay. You're already saying a lot about the, this thing that I want to talk about, the global village business later on, okay? Yes. So now you you also do a bit of training. Yes, I do. Yes, yes I, I saw one of your website, very nice website, zannyreynolds.com.au. Now, so you say that in your business training, you actually incorporate the pursuit of balanced life. Is that possible Absolutely. to have balanced life and run a business at high level? It's not possible to have everything all at once. That's the thing. So I think that when we talk about real estate, a lot of people look at some of the really high performers, you know, the number one, the number two, the number three, the number four, What even the, like the top 50 agents in Australia. Not everybody has everything at once. So I don't think that it you, it's possible to have you know, a $10 million business and still have an amazing family life. I don't think that's possible. And I think people who sell that either aren't being honest or they're not doing it alone. And that's the thing. A lot of the top agents that you see um, that write big dollars, they're not doing it alone. They Some of them have you know, some of them have teams of like 10, 15 people. So, but they're all in the background. Um, so I think that it is possible to have a balanced life, but it's not possible to have everything at once. So you've got to figure out what your priorities are. And I think, you know, um, there's a there's been a lot of talk, you know, in the past at different conferences I've been to about working in sprints. And I think that's a really, really good way to do it because, you know, in my marketplace, school holidays are really quiet. Uh, and um, winter's really quiet. So it's a good time to have, you know, focus more on family, focus more on health, focus more on um, my hobbies. Whereas in spring, 
it is absolutely work, 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 work. So uh, I think you can have balance, but it's probably not the same type of balance that you would have if you were a teacher or if you were, um, you know, working at the local bookstore. Um, that's one of my fantasies, by the way. I always think to myself, oh, what if, if I just worked at the bookstore? <laughs> um, but so I, I think it's different. But, yes, overall, I do believe you can have balance. Um do I always have balance? Absolutely not. Uh, am I going to be contending with a trying to achieve that balance for the rest of my life? Absolutely. Um, but I do think it is possible. Okay. Because, I mean, people are going to listen to this and they need to know you have four stepchildren. Yes. You're running a show. You're out there selling. You're also uh, helping people in Cambodia build their house. You go out there and also, what is it, sponsor about a, a dozen, what is it, community um, events or, or um, how do I say, it, charities. So how do you balance all of that? Something has to suffer. There has to be some element of sacrifice. Oh. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, I guess start from the start. So the four, I have four stepchildren, but they're all older now. So, uh, you know, the youngest just turned 21 uh, last week and the oldest is, um, you know, is in 27, 28 to almost 28. So it's a I'm in a di very different stage of life now. And I think that was one of the reasons why um, Danny and I decided to start the business when we did, because you know, when we started the business uh, five years ago or almost five years ago, four and a half years ago, our youngest was, you know, in her late teens and she was, you know, heading towards finishing high school and we no longer had the obligations of, you know, doing the drop-offs, the pickups, the driving to Taekwondo, picking up from rugby. Um, I've had those obligations uh, and those obligations made it difficult to be, um, I wouldn't be able to run a business. That's the honest truth. I think when I had those obligations, I was working for somebody else and that suited me much better. Um, so so that, I guess, is, um, so you, you can't do everything at once. Uh, in regards to some of the other things you've mentioned, I'm a massive delegator. I am my team will tell you that I'm I'm the biggest delegator. I love to delegate. And um, it's a very hard skill to master because people hate to lose control, particularly sales agents. Sales agents love control. And this is probably the best thing that I learned from James Tossavan was he taught me really how to delegate. And if you can master delegation, you can become the master of your world. So, you share know, that a few, just a few minutes, share, share that tip. Yeah, <laughs> so I think you've got to let go of some of the things that are not important. So, you know, people think everything's important. Oh, my gosh, I've got to be at the photo shoot. I've got to make sure all the photos are amazing for every house. I've got to do the pre-campaign meeting. I've got to, you know, I'm the one that has to make sure that the ad looks amazing. I'm the one that has to, you know, all of those little things and even in your personal life as well, like I have out, I outsource a lot of my personal life. You know, I don't go grocery shopping. Um, I don't clean my own house. Um, you know, I wouldn't, I would not know, you know, I don't get my own car serviced. I don't, all of that type of stuff I've outsourced because if you want to be a high performer, you've got to look at, okay, what, how much do I have to pay someone to actually manage that side of my life? Um, and it's less than what I can earn from being a top salesperson. So the logic is, well, you know, I might as well delegate that. Um, it's I, I heard this person um, recently. His name's Frank Greff. He's the um, he's the chief innovation officer at Domain, um, and he talks about what is your five thousand dollar an hour task because everybody has one. For me, my $5,000 an hour task is listing and selling. So if I am out there listing, I'm that's where I'm making my money. Negotiating on the sale, that's where I'm making the money. Actually physically doing the letterbox drops, cleaning the database, um, you know, answering the phones, that's not my $5,000 an hour um, task. Yes. So... The, the biggest thing, and I, I know you're probably looking for specifics, but the really 
I don't know everybody's lives. So they've got to figure out how to delegate in their own lives. The one thing that I will say is that you have to let go of control. And just because somebody doesn't do the things the same way as you do them doesn't mean the outcome won't be the same. So do you, do you have to let go of control? Do you have to let go of the need for perfection? Both. <laughs> okay. Yeah, both. So uh -huh. you have to you have to let go of control because um like I'll give you an example. A really good friend of mine, she is a, a lawyer and she has her own legal business and she recently hired a nanny so that she can, you know, get more clients and, and grow her business. Now, her nanny doesn't do things the way she does them. And this has really been frustrating me. So she, it's frustrating her. So she calls me and she says, oh, my gosh, things that she's, you know, Alice is not doing things the way I do them. I said, yeah, but at the end of the day, are your kids fed? Are they happy? Are they healthy? Are they having fun? Yes, 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 yes. Well, then who cares how she cooks the noodles or, you know, what, um, you know, how she, which way she drives them to play school. It's a play group. It doesn't matter. Um, so, and I think that's the same in real estate, you know, just because like I prospect a certain way doesn't mean that someone else's prospecting isn't going to get to the same result. So I think that's the control part, but the perfection is also a big part of it. I have um, my saying, and my team will tell you this, but I, I'm always saying to them, progress, not perfection, progress, not perfection. Because if you were waiting for perfection, I never would have started a business. I never, I, I just, I, I'd still be way back at the starting blocks. You are such a passionate person. Now I know, I know your secret. You've got passion in your veins. Now I know why you've got that level of compassion too. So I'm going to get into that bit I wanted to cover with you. You said somewhere that your three core values are about being a good human, make a positive yep. difference, and find enjoyment. Can you just elaborate on those three for me, please? Absolutely. So um, they're actually our company values. So when we started the business, we had a small quorum of um, uh, we were probably about maybe six months in and COVID had already hit. So, you know, we were kind of, you know, looking around for things to do. Um, and we thought, why don't we come up with some company values? And so there was probably about four or five of us and we all sat down and all wrote out our values and then figured out which ones were aligned. And that's they were the kind of the three that, you know, we came up with, you know, worded in different ways. So be a good human, you know, I think that it's something that real estate agents really are, um, you know, a bit confused about, to be completely frank. So to me, be a good human means do the right thing by people so what is going to actually help that person um so it doesn't mean you know if you are presenting an offer and it's not what they want they still might need to move on so presenting that offer and convincing them to take it is still being a good human because it is actually getting the person to their next stage of their their lives uh so so yeah that's kind of what it what it means um but also it means you know being honest being kind being generous um you know for me that's what it what it means and i guess it comes back to the you know the um i think it's a bible saying you know do unto others as you would have them do unto you that's kind of what it comes back to yeah. okay um make a positive difference i think you know everyone in their life wants to make a difference but you have a choice as a person to decide whether that is going to be a positive or a negative di a difference um you know uh, what's a good example? You go out for dinner, okay, and you get a meal and the meal's not great, right? You could get really mad and say, you know, and yell at the waiter and say, oh, this is horrible. Or you could say, listen, I'm so sorry, this is not what I ordered. Could you try and fix it? Now, that's a positive way to deal with that situation and there's also a negative way to deal with it. I guess I'm just the type of person, my husband hates this because I'm always trying to look for the positive way, but I just think that's a better way to live life. So that's that one. <laughs> um, and then uh, find enjoyment. This is the one that I struggle with the most, to be completely honest, um, because I really enjoy real estate. And I find a lot of enjoyment in it. But at the same time, you need to have other things in your life. And so I still, I have to remember and my team remind me that 
you still have to laugh, you still have to celebrate, you still have to do all of that. And I think that's something that a lot of high performers get, um, you know, struggle with is that it's just next deal, get onto the next deal, get onto the next deal, rather than going, oh my gosh, you know, we've done an amazing job, let's enjoy it. And so that's one that I'm still working on. Yeah, okay. I do understand you on that one. Now, uh, so to make a positive difference in, in real estate, when there's um, the, the pool of the commission check, is that mm-hmm. possible to make a positive difference and be a good human? Absolutely it is. I think, you know, people need a service. And I, it's, you know, the holy grail of the tech industry at the moment is trying to figure out how to disrupt real estate. And in my opinion, they're not going to be able to get rid of real estate agents because people, humans who sell houses, who live in houses and want them sold, they want to feel safe. They want to feel secure. They want to feel like they're getting the right advice. And our, our, our um, you know, our job is to provide that right, right advice. You know, how do we do that? I'll give you an example. So I was at an appraisal this morning. It's a beautiful house. And I think most agents would go in there and say to these owners, put it on the market now. It's fully renovated. It's fully starred. It's going to sell really well. Get it done, right? I don't think that's the best thing for them. I think this house is a summer house. It's near the beach. It's got a pool. Um, It's not, you know, I don't know um, where most of your listeners are from, but at the moment in Melbourne, I'm looking out my window and it is cold and it is raining and it is overcast and we're about to head into winter, right? So the best thing for these people is actually to wait until spring, put it on the market when the weather's better and they can showcase their house in the best way so my advice to them this morning was I think that you should wait the market's not amazing right now for your type of home we should be waiting till spring and they were really surprised that I said that but they agreed now in my opinion most agents would go in they just want to get the deal done get the money move on that's not the right advice for those people so I think if you can provide the right advice you are being a good human and when you know if they take my advice which I'm 99.9% sure they will, they're going to pay me a commission check for that advice, um, which I think I will deserve and earn because they've taken the advice and we get a great price when the time is right. And I have no problem with that. But what I'm trying to say is that the other, your other competitors who are trying to get the property right now in their quest of being a real estate agent, they're being pulled between the values of being a good person and giving the right advice yeah. and the commission check right so yeah so that, that's what i meant so i i find that it is very astonishing i've been reading a bit about you and doing a bit of the research and and i find that you're really at the top of your game you you're one of those few who actually also manage to live your values at the same time but then you also find the time to give back now talk to me a little bit about global village housing <laughs> Yeah, so Global Village Housing is an amazing organisation um, run by a wonderful man, um, Jason, and yeah. what they do is they, they build houses for the poorest of the poor. Uh, at, they work in Cambodia. Um, we, are, uh, we are at Shelter about to. We partner with a couple of ch- uh, charities at the moment, but we're in Cambodia, uh, Global Village Housing and another one called Reach, and we're about to start working in Africa as well, in Tanzania. But Global Village Housing just has such an amazing impact. I think that, uh, you know, if if your listeners go to their website, which is just globalvillagehousing.com, they will see the before and after photos of the houses that we build. And the majority of the people that we um, build houses for, that we assist Global Village Housing to build houses for, they live in rubbish tips, um, they live uh, in trees, they, you know, they have have like a couple of pieces of tin that actually suffice as their home and they're not only is it not safe it's not hygienic they don't have running water they don't have electricity um, they don't have access to you know and they're they're the basic things so then because they don't have that that means they don't have access their kids don't have access to education they you know 
find it hard to get stable employment, all of those types of things. So I just feel that shelter is such, you know, the basic part of um, being a human If is having that safe and secure shelter. So providing that house that we do, and please don't get me wrong, they are not glamorous houses. They aren't glamorous, but they are safe, they are secure, and they are sturdy. The shelters. That then allows that. The shelters, exactly, yeah. Um, that then allows the people who we home to focus on, okay, well, now I can consider looking for a job. Now I can actually, I don't have to worry about where I'm going to sleep tonight. I can go and figure out how I'm going to feed myself or educate my children or whatever the, the next um, the next step is. And I think, you know, it's, it's not, it's not a, it's not a big it's not a big thing for us. It really isn't. Like in reality, the cost of the houses is so small in comparison to not only the sale values of the houses that I sell, but the commission checks that we get uh, that, you know, I just um, I just think it's the least I can do. Do you, do you stay in touch with these people in Cambodia then or in Africa that you're going to be? I mean, those houses, you know, the family that move in and, and, and do they, I mean, you're not just doing that. You also have, I think, sponsorship for for bicycle, allowing uh, kids to go to school or, yeah. or to do their chores, right? Yeah, so that's a different <laughs> charity that we sponsor. So we do that through our property management department. So if you um, if you work with us and we manage um, your prop our property for you, every property we manage um, feeds a, a a child for a month every month. So um, we provide. Uh, so we, we partner with a, a, um, a charity called Reach and what they do is they have so many programs. The program that we sponsor is their Rice for Awards, which uh, provides um, rice, eggs and other food for, for children who attend their school. So they and the school's free. But what they're trying to do, that charity's trying to do, is really take the current generation to uh, educate the current generation so that they can get the families out of poverty because it's a very vicious cycle you know if the um the parents are in poverty the children are normally in poverty and then that cycle continues so if the kids go to school for over 80 percent of the month then they get the um they get the 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 rice rewards and so it actually means that the the parents don't have to have their children begging on the street or out working because they are uh, know that they're going to get fed for the month so that's something that we we do. Um, that charity also has, um, as part of their program, what they do is they take in old bicycles and they teach some of the older children how to repair them. So they're effectively giving them a trade. Uh, so that's kind of the an, another part of the the school that they run. So if the the children, the older children come in and learn the trade, learn the mechanical skills. So not only are they coming to school and actually learning, they're making sure that the food is going to be provided for their family and they're getting an education that is hopefully then going to get them a job um, as a bicycle mechanic or um, working in, you know, in, in one of the organisations that run tuk-tuks or things like that. So, yeah, that's that's what that what they do. Okay. Um, do I stay in touch? So uh, I... My skill, I would love to stay in touch. I um, I don't stay in touch with every single family. We, what we do, what we've organised... You, with... you don't write to those 423 people? What's wrong with you? I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, do you know what? A lot of them don't have... There's no mail service over there, so even if I did. Um, and a lot of them don't have computers or you know anything like that um so but what we do is we do see the um we do the charities that we work with do stay in, in touch with them so you know the global village housing is an amazing charity that it actually employs uh, a number of cambodian people who manage the charity and stay in touch with the with the villagers um, and you know how those people are going because we need to make sure that the the houses that we're providing are still being used by the people they're provided for and that you know they're not um, being strong armed out by other people or the you know they're not being destroyed or sold or anything like that so it is something that is very closely monitored and we do get updates regularly um, from the charities you know the before the after the 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 down the track so. Yeah. Do you know, <clears throat> now you don't have to answer the next question, okay? But I, I'm just speaking my mind. I think I found your 
your your secret. You've got a lot of compassion flowing through your veins. I, I just wonder sometimes, are some of us fortunate or maybe unfortunate in the past that now we look at the silver lining, are fortunate enough that we have experienced something in the past that now allows us to bond with the need of others now, and, and therefore it becomes a fuel in, within us to, to urge us to do the best we can in our, in our job, in, in our duty, because that, that vehicle can help us feel a bit of that void that we feel through helping others. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that, um, you know, everybody's got a story. This is the thing, Thomas. Everybody has a story. You know, I have a story. I have tr I've had tragedy in my life. Um, I've been through hard times. Um, but I don't think I'm alone. I think everybody has. Whether you've lost a loved one, you've been through a divorce, you've had a, you know, a serious illness, everybody has um, has been through something. And I think that, you know, if you can, you know, I'm pa I'm passionate about um, shelter and and housing and particularly Cambodia for you know, tragic reasons of my own. You know, your passion might be, um, you know, helping find a cure for cancer. Um, it might be animal welfare. It might be, you know, it could be a, a whole, you know, whole list of different things. Whatever you're passionate about, just go for it and try and combine that with what you do every day because that's how you're going to get yourself to the next level because, you know, I can, you know, I can tell you, I met a lady recently actually, this is a good story, and she was so lovely. She was not much younger than me and she'd worked for the last um, 10 years on a private yacht oh, wow. just yeah. out of Monaco, right? And it was a private, not one of the ones you can hire, not one of the ones on below deck. It was a very, very wealthy family who just had this yacht. And they used to come on the yacht and she would look after them. They, it was a massive yacht. They had 16 crew members full time. And I said to her, I said, I had two questions for her. The first was, what's the most ridiculous thing you've seen? And she the, the answer to that was that she had to put life, do life jackets on the dogs so that they wouldn't fall overboard, which I thought was hilarious because I am I love my dog. The chihuahua? So I definitely understand the need. I've got my little chihuahua. And <laughs> so I definitely will understand, you know, I'm, now I'm trying to search for a life jacket for her. Um, so that was the most ridiculous thing. And the second thing was what was the most important thing you learnt um, you know, given that these are very wealthy people, what's the most important thing that you learn? And she said to me that you can have all the money in the world and it doesn't make you happy. She said these are some of the wealthiest, wealthiest people in the world, multi-billionaires, and she said they were some of the unhappiest people that she'd ever met in her life. And I just think, you know, I've always thought that money doesn't buy happiness but it just kind of you know really solidified that for me that you know in we money helps don't get me wrong it helps but you've got to combine that with a passion that really does feed you and drive you and give you that sense of satisfaction yeah M money helps you quench the thirst of the first of the six human needs that correct Oslo talks about but after the first level is being done, I mean, money can't help you with the other five levels, right? So we, we understand that. Now, being a compassionate level, now I'm going to bring it back a little bit of work. Do you find that sometimes we being used by maybe by our staff, by our employees, by people? 100%. 100%. Oh, my God. I <laughs> wish I had the answer to that question. You know, I, uh, you know, probably more recently, um, as recently as this year, I've, like I can, I can feel that I, I have felt very used, um, you know, and you, particularly when you've been doing something for so long and, you know, you've kept in touch with someone for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, you've helped them design their house, you've, you know, made sure the floor plan's right, you've put them in touch with builders, you've done all this work and then they go and sell with someone else, um, you know, that cuts deep, like it really, really does. Um, it really does. But I think to myself, okay, do I want to live the other way and be closed and not be a giving person? No. So I don't want to be that that way. And I think 
probably, I'm not going to say nine times out of 10, but probably seven times out of 10, if you're a giving person, then you get back what you give. And yes, there's people that do use and abuse, but I think as you get older and the more experience you get, you learn who you can learn who the users and abusers are and you can see the signs. And I think you just try and steer clear of if, of those people. And, you know, the one thing that real estate agents probably don't exercise enough is their own option of choice. You don't have to sell for everybody, you know. You just don't have to. Um, you know, I uh, I got an email the other day um, from someone who I actually I I don't think I want to sell for them. I I don't um, I haven't had many dealings with them, but I just don't think they're my type of person. Their property is definitely not my type of property, but I do think that they'll go well with one of my team members. I think their personality will gel well with one of the guys in my office. Um, he sells that type of property. So, you know, I forwarded it on to him and said, hey, I think you should really get in touch with this person. I think it's the right kind of person for you um, because not everybody gels. I don't gel well with every, everybody, hopefully most people, but you know, you can exercise your choice is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Well, you probably want to deal with people who've got no heart. But so let me ask you one last thing before I, I let you go. <clears throat> you have you have a quote on one of uh, your photos on your website that says, love many, trust a few, paddle your own. Always paddle own. your own what, canoe. What, what, what does that mean? So first of all, we... Oh, we I Love many, they so there's three parts. But yeah, don't trust any, uh, trust a few and, and always paddle your own canoe. Yeah, so I mean the trust view is probably the thing that people get caught up with. Um, so I'm I'm a big lover, I'm a lover of everything. I, you know, I go in um I I go in to every relationship with the mindset that people are gonna treat me well and I'm gonna treat them well. And I think that's where the trust view is a little bit of a reminder to me that not everybody has the good intentions that nice. I have um, because, you know, I have been burnt a lot uh, in the past. But, um, but I, I, you know, love is like it's just whether it's love of a friend, love of a job, love of my dog, you know, that's the way you want to live life. So, yeah. you know, you just have to keep going. But it just, the trust view just reminds me, you know, not everybody's, uh, uh, you know, got, um, you know, altruistic motives. So, you know, but I am a very trusting person. I will say that. I do yeah. trust lots of people. Um, and always paddle your own canoe. Nobody's going to do it for you, you know. And this is the thing in real estate that I think a lot of people you know, a lot of people. Um, uh, it just it astounds me. Sorry, I'm I'm struggling for words because it does astound me. Uh, I'll give an example. I, I I will give an example of my team. So I recently decided to have a little bit of time off um, over Easter, and the first thing that the the team want. Oh, so you know who's going to get Zaley's leads? Who's going to get her call ins? Who's going to look after a database while she's away? Blah 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 blah. blah. At the end of the day, you got to do it for you, right? If you're looking for a handout, you are never going to be a superstar. It is just never going to happen. If you don't pick up that paddle and start actually paddling the canoe, that canoe ain't going anywhere. It's going around in circles. So you have to do it. It's up to, you know, it's like the saying, if it's if it's meant to be, it's up to me. You got to do it. Okay. All right. I, I, I thought I'd better ask you, even though... <laughs> They, 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 it's unknown quotation. I think it started in, was it 1914? That, 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 uh, that really. I don't know where, yeah. yeah, who said it. I because, saw it in a magazine once and I thought I love that. <laughs> yes, because it was a change from love many, uh, trust a few, uh, and do wrong to none. Ah, and, and the that. do wrong to none has been removed to put this one in. Yeah, and, and so I thought, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. I better have a look and 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 probably ask, you know, Zali, she'll tell me. But you know what, Zali, yeah. let me tell you, um, I I was really look, looking forward to interviewing you because from what I see, your passion is about people and housing and all these things that you do. It, it's really about helping people, 
And and we are in the industry where we don't sell houses. We move people. Hence, right. it makes you even more powerful in, in what you do, you know. And this yeah. is why... The people business. Yes. And, and I think that this is why you are really a power horse. And now I know where they put you at the top. It's yeah. taken me a little, little bit of time now, but now I realize what, how they made the decision. I, I really thank you for this. And, and I hope that we can catch up at some stage and talk a little bit more about that compassionate side of yours, because I think if we use it properly, compassion can do enormous amount of good thing in real estate. Unfortunately, Absolutely. compassion is removed from the transaction and, and, it takes people like you to probably bring that compassionate level back to real estate transactions. I 100% agree with you. And I think it should be in every part of our business. So I think one area that we can start with really easily is, you know, not just compassion to clients, but compassion to other agents. You know, one thing, don't get me wrong, I love some healthy competition, but I think that it's gotten to you know, almost a toxic level, the competitiveness between agents. And there's enough to go around, people. Like, there is enough houses to go around. And so I think that, you know, um, the compassion is, I agree with you, it's a really, really important part. And you've got a lot to offer. So make sure you take your break. Yes. And, and, and you find that that bit of injection into you. Because I think that real estate still needs a lot of that compassion that is within you. I thank you so much for today. No problems. Thank you for having me. All right. We'll talk soon. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.